Yes, once again, we have liftoff. I want to thank you for listening to this episode of the Big Truth Podcast. Um, my guest today is an old friend of mine, um, and uh, he is uh, he came out here from uh, he braved the, uh, the 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 East Coast COVID to uh, come down from Pennsylvania today. And uh, his name's Eric Utch. You might know him if you're into uh, MMA fighting or Muay Thai fighting. Um, and so, without further ado, let's just get into it. What's happening, Eric? Hello, how are you guys doing out there? <laughs> Such a cordial guy. See that? He, he's addressing all the people listening. I, I always forget to do that. No, but but again, yeah, if you're listening today, thank you for listening and uh, taking the time out of your day to, to give us uh, some uh, some of your mental space, I guess. I don't know what I'm saying, but um, we're all frazzled. We just came from the tattoo shop. I haven't tattooed, I haven't uh, lasered anybody in months, and um, uh, Eric came down. We gave him a little laser on his arm, and it felt good to fire up that machine again. Uh, um, the business isn't open, so you know any of you fucking rats out there, or anybody <laughs> listening, we're not opening. I just lasered a friend really quick, um, and uh, when when uh, never when, know if Atashi's listening. Yeah, yeah. When fucking when lasering is outlawed, only outlaws will have lasers. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, it's still uh, my shop. I still pay rent there. If a friend comes by, I don't think it's any issue. And um, and we 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 didn't stay six feet apart, but uh, we wore masks, yes, <laughs> and goggles, and, and goggles, goggles and, and full body condoms, and uh, <laughs> and then uh, that was that. But but yeah, so Eric is a uh, four time Muay Thai uh, world champion. He uh, represented the USA a few times in the in, in, in Asian in, games. In, in the Asian games, uh, he was also an MMA fighter. He's and and uh, in the early days, in the early days, so before, let's before all the rules and the gloves and all that fancy stuff. Yeah, because even when I remember when it first first when I first was exposed to it, it was still a little more wild style. But I'm sure it had more rules than when you you had you had started. I started fighting. Uh, UFC three was out, so that's okay. when I started off fighting uh, South Plainfield, New Jersey. Yeah, and they um, had it licensed at. Um, as a shoot boxing, like a Japanese style. So no, no one in America knew what it was. So no, the athletic commission never even showed up. Okay. There, there was no scales, no nothing. You just get back to back, like in fifth grade and ever matched up with height and size wise. Like, Oh, you guys fight. Okay. Yeah. One time the guy outweighed me like 40, 50 pounds, but I still won, you know, I had good training with, with the uh, Henzo's and, and the Gracie's in New York's. So I had good training. It was a good time. So, well, fuck yeah, man. Why don't we just kind of go back to the beginning? What what initially got you into fighting? And then, like, how did you find your way into, like, um, you know, like training and then competing? Like, you know, like. Uh, okay. So I basically was in, what was it? Uh, I was basically in 11th grade. And uh, everyone was talking about the UFC. It was like a big thing. And I, I got the chance to watch it at my buddy's house. And I was like, there's no way this skinny ass dude's beating all these big dudes. I'm like, this shit's fake. This is like professional wrestling or whatever. And then I was running my mouth because I was a big mouth kid and I was in um, gym class. And this kid was like, yo, man, my, my brother's really good with uh, Hoist and Henzo and all these Gracies. He's like, if, you know, if you have that big mouth here, why don't you go to come over this weekend when everyone's hanging out and see if you have a big mouth? And I was like, all right, cool, I'll come over. So I, I met up with them where they were supposed to be at this, this gym by my house, this Christ school, actually. They would rent some time there. And then I walked in. And then I was like, yo, I want to challenge you. And Henzo was super cool. He was like, you don't want to challenge me. You want to challenge my little friend. And I was like, I'm going to beat up your little friend, and I'm going to beat up you. He's like, all right, my man. <laughs> he's like, all right, my man. Let, let's see how this goes. And so like, you're in high school. I'm in high school. Yeah. I'm in um, 11th grade. Yeah. One more year before I graduate. So then I, this little this little scrawny-ass dude fucking ties me up in a pretzel and fucking tap out. And then Henzo's like, oh, beginner luck, beginner luck. Let, let, let's try it again. And I try again, and he beats me again. And I'm sitting, I remember sitting there holding my head and thinking, like, how the fuck is this? Little, I can't, can we curse on here? I don't oh, know. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I was like, how the fuck is this little ass dude tying me up like this? And then Enzo's like, what do, you, what do you think about jujitsu? And me, in my mind, because I'm fucking nuts, I was like, man, if this little guy can beat me up, picture how many bigger dudes I can beat up. <laughs> uh, you know, because I'm way bigger than him. I just started training all the time. I remember this guy coming in one day, and he's like, hey, there's these fights in New Jersey. Does anyone want to fight? And I was like, I'll fight. And everyone's like, man, you just started. And I was like, I don't care. I want to go try this out. Well, how long have you, how long have you been training before maybe, that guy came maybe, in? Maybe a month or two. Okay. Not, not very long at all. You know, just had very basics. Now, before we go further, like, 
Were, were you like a fighter before that? Were you yeah, like I, getting yeah, the- I was like, a, you know, a street kid, like a big mouth, you know, like, yeah. you know, how did anyone that grew up in a, in a small, small area is like, oh, John, John's the toughest guy on the, on the schoolyard. And you want to go fight John and you okay. John, oh, you know, Eric's the toughest guy in the schoolyard. And then, you know how it is. And you had to, you had to hold the, the schoolyard yeah, title. Yeah, 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 <laughs> you had to hold that yeah, belt. Yeah, yeah, you had to have that belt, you know. <laughs> but for, for someone, 11th grade, you're probably what, 16, 17? Yeah, I was, yeah, seventeen probably. Yeah. yeah. So, you, I, so I, you, you go into Gracie's gym and be like, "Yeah, I'm going to beat you up, <laughs> and uh, I'll beat that guy up, and then uh, I'm going to come beat yeah. you up." So you had a confidence about you for yeah, sure. I was def- <laughs> definitely a moron. From a young, definitely a moron from a young age. <laughs> All right. So, 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 but that's actually pretty funny. Like the the. Um, like you, he, he must be a pretty fucking cool guy because like the way he handled it, uh, super cool. Like he, I, I met fighters all over the world. I lived in numerous countries. He, in every one of my interviews, I always thanked him wherever I was. He was just the nicest, good-hearted guy you can possibly meet. Yeah, because for someone to come in like that, all blustery, and he's just like, all right, well, yeah. that's. A- <laughs> but that, that 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 time period, everyone was doing that. You know, you had karate guys, wrestlers. Everyone was coming in and trying it out because everyone seen the UFC and didn't believe. It. Yeah, and that's how they sold their product. You know? Yeah, yeah, because you said there was only a couple of them out by then. Yeah, it was, so. like, it was like two, like literally three. I think it was like Chemo versus Ken Shamrock. I seen that fight, and then I was like, you know, yeah, no, well, no, I'm sorry, it was Chemo versus versus Hoist. Yeah, and then I was like, there's no way this small dude's beating all these big ass dudes. Yeah, and I was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give it a run for my money. So you start, so you started training there, and then a month or so later, some guy comes in and goes, yeah. "Hey, there's some fights in New Jersey. Who's yeah. ready?" Yeah, and I was like, "I'll do it." Yeah, and then, you know, and then they let me try, and I did really good. You know, I, I I won my first fight, and I'm like, "Wow, this is great." You know, like no rules, no gloves, whatever. Just go out there and just duke it out. So what was it like for you? So you you you'd only been training like a month or so, and I, then you you one, went and did your first fight. For, you you for, traveled to Jersey. Yeah. So what was that kind of process for, like? For, for one, I had a lie. I had a lie about my. Uh, my eight, because it said like eight, 18. And I signed a waiver and I was like 17. Yeah. I, you know, I was like, oh, so I just signed like I was 18. I lied. And then I get there and I, I'm, I'm fighting and you're just, you know, I haven't, you know, I haven't fought in real a crowd. And I, I remember my buddy, my buddy's like, hey, we want to like, go check out the ring before your fight. And it was like, oh, uh, like a, a wrestling, a boxing ring. It wasn't like no cage yet. The cage wasn't the yeah. cage was for the bigger shows, but the smaller shows had cheap. Cheap supplies. My buddy goes to me. He's like, "Hey, run and bounce off the ropes that like they do on TV." So I went running and dove into these ropes, and they, they don't they don't bend like that in real life. So I was like, "Ah!" And I, remember, I remember doing that. And then I was like, I was like nervous, you know. I was yeah, like, yeah. You know. So you just kind of came out full retard, ran, just, running right into I, the ropes. I just, yeah, I just it, it was it was a big mess, you know. Luckily, luckily I won. Luckily, luckily I won. So who? What was the style? Of, did, now, did you fight just like brawling, or did you fight using jujitsu? I, I had I had no striking besides I had no no stand up at all besides the street brawls, and yeah. I, I had like two or three months of jujitsu. Yeah, so I was listed as a jujitsu fighter, and I, I believe I, I I fought like another brawler or whatever. Yeah, when there was still like a yeah, brawler yeah, category, yeah, there was, was brawler category, and then I uh, I went back a couple months later and and I won again. And then the, the but I was winning, but I had no striking, so I was like. Raising my hand. Were you tapping people I out? I was tapping. Them. I got. I, I got. I fought three MMA rules with no with no gloves and all like that. I tapped everyone out with the arm bar, but not, my face was all beaten, you know, because I had no striking. So I was like, I'm winning, but I look like I'm losing. Yeah. So then I um I go to Henzo. I this is a magazine called Grappler, you know, back in the early days, and I had an ad from Melcher Maynor, and it said, "Would you like to be a world champion from your home?" And I was like, "Yeah, this is perfect. I got <laughs> I got a house, you know, I got, you know, I, got, I can order this video and become world champion." So I ordered Melcher's video. I told Hansel, I was like, hey, man, I need to work on my striking a little bit. Then I'll be back. So he was like, cool, you know, go work on boxing or whatever. He didn't realize I was buying a home video. Yeah. <laughs> so I buy this home video, and then I get it, and then there's a kickboxing gym in my town. This guy, Christian Corley, had a kickboxing gym. So then I went down to the gym, and I was, and I was a poor kid. You know, I didn't have no money. I had no job. I was still in high school. So I said, hey, how much would it be just to kick the back? Like, just come in, not take any of your classes. I just want to come and work these moves I know on the back. He's like, I forget what he said, like. Twenty dollars a month, thirty dollars a month, crazy. So then I was doing these techniques, and then he comes up to me. He's like, "Oh, this is all wrong." And I was like, "What do you mean it's wrong?" He's like, "Oh, let me show you some things." You know, it's his hustle. You know, it's his hustle. I'm trying to get me as a client. So I get mad because I'm, I'm a fucking poor kid. I'm like, this motherfucker in this video ripped me off for like 150 bucks. 
So don't I call the, the back in the, the the video? They have a phone number, you know, like one eight hundred like box. Yeah. So I call up, as the guy who owns the videos answers the phone. I was like, "Hello, this is Henzo Gracie's manager. I would really like Melcher Maynor to give me a call back to set up uh, training between Henzo and Melcher." For the next couple of UFCs, so he calls back right away, and I'm like, "Yo, motherfucker!" <laughs> I was like, "I'm from Allentown, Pennsylvania, and you ripped me off. I want my hundred fifty dollars back." And he's like, "I guarantee everything on my videos. I guarantee it." And I was like, "How can we solve this problem?" And I was like, "Do you do seminars?" He's like, "Yeah, I do a seminar." I was like, "All right." So I hustled up some money and I flew him in for a seminar. And as soon as he walked in the door, the guy that was saying all the moves are wrong, oh, he was all pale and whatever. Boom, run for the door. I was like, "Oh my god!" So Melcher was right. So he teaches me that day, and he's like, yo, man, you, have a, you seem like you have a really good heart, and you're a nice guy and whatever. Not only that, you got initiative. Yeah, true. It's like you like literally called the dude. Oh, you yeah. knew what to say to get him yeah, to yeah, actually call you back. back as a 17-year-old kid. You yeah. know what I mean? That's like like hustle, like street smart. <laughs> you know what I mean? And true. then, and so you you showed initiative. And if someone did if someone did that to me, dude, I would yeah, be like, fuck yeah, this this dude's fucking serious. So then he was, then he was just like, I was like, hey, man, like thanks for coming out. If you ever need a favor. You know, hit me up. So a couple a couple months later, you know, he calls him on the phone. He's like, hey, have you been working the stuff from the video? I said, yeah, I've been working the stuff from the video. He's like, hey, remember when you said when you drive me off the airport, if you ever need a favor to give you a call? I'm like, yeah, what do you need, like 10, 20 bucks? Like, what's up? He's like, no, I need a fighter. And I was like, oh, man, like, I don't know any Muay Thai fighters. And then he's just like, you. And I was like, oh, man, I, I just do this as a hobby. I'm, I'm, I'm an MMA guy. And he's like, well, he said, you know, he's like, why don't you come out? Train with me for like a week or two. Then we're going to go to uh, uh, Compton, California, which I didn't know it was Compton at the time. It ended up being Hollywood Park Casinos in Angle X. I think it's Englewood, but okay. they called it Compton. Yeah. But um, he said, like, come on out, train with me. Then we're going to go to like uh, LA and we're going to fight. And I was like, well, wow, my, my word's good. So I told you I'd fight, so I'd fight. So I'm thinking I'm going to go get beat up. Fly out there, train with them for a couple of weeks. We go to, we go to, we're like, oh, we're going to Englewood. And I'm like, what? And the only thing I know about California, first time I was on, ever on an airplane, first time I basically leave Pennsylvania and I'm fighting in South Central. I'm like, this is great. I'm like, the only yeah. thing I know about South Central is Boys in the Hood and yeah. Fridays and all those movies. I'm like, oh, I'm getting shot. You know, I'm going to be the white guy laying on the fucking lawn yeah, yeah. and blast it all up. So we go there and I'm getting my hands wrapped and he's like, oh, uh, Boss Rutan's behind you. And I'm like, whatever. Like, Boss Rutan's going to come see me fight. But Melcher and Boss Rutan were really good friends. So he's like, oh, my fighter's going to fight. Come watch my fighter. So I turn around and me and Boss Rutan make eye contact. And I look at the ground. He totally punks me out without saying nothing. So I look at the ground. I'm like, what the hell is this guy punking me out? Man, I, he never said nothing. So I look up again. He punks me out. I look at the ground. I was like, man, I was so nervous that fight. The front row was Boss Rutan, Quentin Jackson. There was a, the two guys that stick out my brain. So the, they call my name. The curtains open up. And they, they bring me in the back door. They never bring me in the front door. They bring you in the back door when you're fighting, you know? Yeah. So they open it up. It's like 8,000 people there for my first fight. Like, <laughs> Your first fight. And so you've had a couple of little fights like, in New Jersey. Yeah, like, but you went and trained with a guy for a couple of weeks. Yeah. In your first fight. Yeah. And now I'm fighting a real Muay Thai because Muay Thai was way more popular at this time period than MMA was. So MMA I mean, I had 100 people. Like a, a school, like a, like, a, like a school wrestling match where yeah. I was there. So then, yeah, it was still, even though there was a couple of them on uh, that you could watch, it was yeah. still like really yeah, yeah, the, all, the ground floor of it. Yeah. So it was more grassroots. Yeah. So then, so then I go to Hollywood Park Casino, they open this curtain. I look around, I'm like, oh, I just get so panicky. I just run to the ring. I'm just running. And now she's like, wait up, wait up. And I'm like, slide on the ropes, which is totally disrespectful in Thai boxing. You have to go over the ropes. I didn't know this. Yeah. Everyone's booing me. And I'm like, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> so I, this guy comes out and we start swinging on each other like a, a barroom brawl. The round goes over. Go back to the corner. He's trying to get my attention. He's slapping me. He's like, pay attention to what I'm saying. I'm like, oh, I'm way over my head. I'm way over my yeah, head. Yeah, yeah. So he's like, you must have had such a fucking adrenaline oh, surge. Like, yeah. I'm like looking over seeing like Quentin Jackson, all these <laughs> famous, like eventually famous fighters, boss yeah. room. And I'm like, man, I'm like, way over my head. So then the, the second, the bell rings, the second round comes out. And I go, bang. I punch this guy with the right hand. And knock him stone cold. I'm like, oh my! I'm cheering, jumping around like the, like the idiot, running on the ropes like the ultimate warrior. And I'm like, <laughs> you know, I'm not just like, calm down, calm down. And then um, I looked over. I'm like, yo, this is where I'm supposed to be. I was like, no more MMA. I love this. Yeah. I never looked back. And you were 17 or 18. By so then, I was probably 18. Yeah. So did he ever explain to you what made him give you a call? Because like, so you call this guy, you kind of call him out. Yeah. Then you then you scrape some money together, bring them over to your gym for a seminar. Yeah, and then 
for some reason, you tell them you ever if you ever need a favor for me, <laughs> yeah. uh, give me a call. Yeah, I, I got you. Yeah. And then he literally calls you a couple yeah. months later and is like, I need a fighter. And yeah. all you've been doing is self-practicing with no coaching no, or anything. Almost all my career I was self-practicing because everyone, everyone, my little town didn't have no one big. You know, yeah. I, I was had to go to L.A. I went to Thailand. I went to Europe. I went to Holland. You know, wherever where I was in my mind, I to be the best, you got to be around the best. So wherever it so was. So where did you get the discipline from to, to bring yourself to the gym and practice these moves that you saw on a video, a home video? Did you bring the video with you to the to No, I just remember it. Just, you know, just, just basic combos. You know, everything, uh, everything is, they teach you in those videos like numbers and whatever. And you, it says whenever you want, you just switch the numbers up and make your own your own thing. Yeah. Very simple, you know. Yeah. I mean, it's just like building a bike. You know, there's there's a basic way of doing it. And then you can add your own paint. You can change the sure. handlebar. I mean, yeah. same, same basic thing. Okay. Here's like the formula, and then you can mix it up and make your own. So, were you you, you were still in school? Yeah, I was, I was still. Uh, by the time I started Thai boxing, I think I just graduated. Prior to the MMA, the whole MMA career, I was still in high school. Yeah. Yeah. So, what was like? How how often were you going to the gym? Like, how how long were you training? Like, the, the, when I was doing the, the MMA in the beginning, yeah, I was there. Five days a week, seven days a week, because it was close to me. It was like, yeah. they had a, a Gracie gym in my town. Then Thai boxing, there was no gym in my town, so basically, a, I bought a bag, and you know, a, a buddy was like, "Oh, I did karate back in the day. I was like, oh, come over and let's like duke around, and you just you yeah. just mess around a little bit." And then whenever I could fly out of California, I would, you know. Yeah. But that, that's that's what got me good. I, I think I think that's why it got me so good in so many different aspects of kickboxing, Thai boxing, because. I had to learn off YouTube, basically, off of videos. Yeah. I mean, not YouTube in the beginning, but it was VHS tapes. So yeah. this guy would be like, hey, I got these fighters on this tape. You know, I got Koban or Junksanon or whoever. And I was like, oh, I had this these guys. And then we would trade the videotapes, and then I, I get to watch a whole different style. Mm. And then and then at the end, Mel Melcher would be like, oh, find videos with Danny Bill. This is a very famous black fighter. And then I was like, find Danny Bill's videos. And then I'd watch Danny Bill's style. Then I'd be like, all right, he beat all these guys, but who beat him? Then I'd find videos with him losing. Hmm. I was like, how do they lose him? You know, how do they beat him? And you'd look at that, and I figured it out. And then I'd be like, now I follow this guy. Now who beat him? Hmm. And then that's I just started like learning different styles. So basically at the end, when he would want me to change my style up, he would just yell out, Koban style, Denny uh, Bill style. Just I, by name, I, by I, name. I, I knew what to do. I, fancy or slick or more, yeah. more, more pressure, more so, whatever. So, so he would yell that out based on... The, the, no, how the fight was going how the fight was going yeah. and, and and it was like almost like a strategy you use yeah. this guy's system yeah. against this guy yeah. and, and vice versa and I, I was just so so i would wake up in the morning at that point i'd wake up in the morning go to work come home take a nap watch videos go to the gym practice what was on the videos come home watch more videos go to bed and do it every seven days a week. that's what you're doing how long were you were you, like you'd get out of work how long were you going to the gym for to, to train at, at that time period probably three hours a day yeah you know until i got more of a professional thing and I would do six hours because it would be three in the morning three at night yeah so so this guy calls you up you go you you, you win you win your first couple fights and then you're uh, like this is for me so what was the next step from there uh with him I, I won the first three fights and then I lost and then he got real mad that I lost and then we, we separated ways because he was my my manager and my trainer then he's like oh go is it easier is it, it's easier for you to train with this guy so he gave me some old Thai guy's name out in the woods in, in uh, actually New York. He was lived in uh, Wind, Windale, New York. Uh, this guy Coban lived in. So I finally got people that knew him because he had no phone, no nothing. He was, you know, a Thai guy living in the country. I finally got a hold of him and said, I want to train. This guy gave me your name. And he's like, not really interested. I guess a couple months went by and he was just like, all right. And he just called me back one day. He's like, be here like Wednesday at five o'clock. And I just took a bus up to Windale, New York. I went to Manhattan to from there, I transferred buses, went to Windale, and we just started training with him, and then got a couple fights because he had a famous name, so I got a couple fights just because I knew him, and then um, what was it? Two, uh, 05. 05, I um, flew to Fair uh, California to train this a really famous gym called Fairtex, and then I, I, it was like pay eight hundred dollars and become a Fairtex fighter. It was a hustle. Everything, everything in the world is a hustle. Everyone, everyone's in a hustle. You see, better get a hustle yeah. back on them. So. I pay this $800. I go train with this guy for a couple of days. I go spar. I get killed because these guys are all major pros. And then I go home all, all depressed like anyone would be when you fail. 
save one, save up some more money and go back again, try out again, get killed. And I got my, my face split open this time. But the second time I brought my girlfriend with me at the time, this girl, my, uh, Myra Soul, she was a fighter also. So I brought, but as I was training, she didn't have the $800 to try out. So she would sit there and she would talk to the front desk girl. So we thought this front desk girl was the janitor's daughter. So she was like talk, talking to her like she's normal. So when my time was all up and done and I, I didn't make the grade again, uh, her name was Mimi. Actually, she ended up being my manager. But uh, she's like, hey, Eric, you ever think about being a fair tech fighter? I'm like, oh, I didn't make the cut. She's like, it doesn't matter what they say. It matters what I say. And I'm like, ain't you uncle's daughter? I thought it was a janitor's daughter. She's like, no, I'm not uncle's daughter. She's like, I'm Phil Wong's daughter. Phil Wong's the one who owned the, the, all these gyms all over the world, like Thailand, here, there. I was like, holy shit. She's like, if you want to be a fair tech fighter, you're a fair tech fighter. And then I, she's like, I'm looking for starting my own team up. Hmm. I was like, all right, I'm down. And she's started, you know, more doors open. And I started fighting all over, you know, b bigger shows all over the world. So, I mean, th the lesson here is if you want something, go after it. Yeah, and you just got to be there. You got to go in 110%, you know. And you got to be there, you, you know. Gotta like, you got to put your time in, with whatever, you know. If you want to be, the look at Eddie Van Halen, right? I seen a, a video, a, a documentary about Van Halen when I was a kid, still into, like, hair metal and stuff. I still meant hair metal. Yeah. But, like, <laughs> the, the beginning of hair metal. Yeah. And Eddie, Van, um, um, what's his brother? Michael, oh, no, no, what's his, Alex. Alex would be like, oh, I have a date. And then Eddie would be on the end of the bed playing the guitar. And he said he would go on a date, have dinner, you know, try to get in, whatever, come back. And Eddie was still playing that guitar on the edge of the bed. And that always stuck in my head. Yeah. You're good at something, you got to put hours and hours in. They say you got to put, what is it, 10,000 hours in to, to be like proficient or master or something. Yeah. And, and you know, and, and at the basics too. Like everyone, yeah. want, everyone wants to learn. Like don't even want to learn the basics. They want to skip the basics and suddenly be like, oh, you know, I, I want to learn. I learn jumping across the ring or, or flying in the air. You got to learn yeah. the basics. You know? Yeah. So, uh, the, the most money I ever fought was seventeen seconds. It was ten thousand dollars, and it was a jab cross. Something you learned your first lesson. Yeah. I just went jab cross and knocked this fool out, and I won more money than ever. Yeah, in my, in my, I mean, yeah, in, in seventeen seconds in the next, seventeen and, seconds, and, and you're not beat up or nothing. You're nothing. ready to roll. Se the yeah, seventeen seconds, ten, ten thousand dollars. Got out of the ring, had a stripper ass girlfriend this time. I was like, we're going to Hawaii, <laughs> <laughs> and everyone are laughed around me, and I fucking literally had her call the airline, and we went to Hawaii. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I hey, just, yeah. So, so how did it? You know, how did you transition into like? Um, so from there. You know, you started winning fights, and then you became a fair text fighter. Yeah, um, and, and is that when you started uh, more like you know? That's when I'm, I moved to Thailand. Then I went to Thailand for a year. I stayed at Fair Text in uh, Bung Pli. Okay, and then, and then I had the opportunities to fight for. Uh, U um, hold on, my brain. No, I had no. a, I had a chance to fight for the, uh, the Asian Games, representing our con uh, country, and then you know I I didn't win no gold medal, but at least I was in the mix. Yeah. Then after that, I came back, and then my style was just changing. I, I boxed a lot for, and the, the ties didn't like it. You know, the ties didn't like my styles. They, that's ties like when you kick and you knee a lot and you elbow a lot. But it was really, my style, I enjoyed the boxing. So everyone was like, you, you should basically, if you want to get bigger and whatever, go to Europe. You know, that's where your style fits in, more like the K1 style, the glory style. So uh, luckily, I don't know, for some reason, I always step in shit, I guess the term would say. <laughs> And I contacted Andy Sauer through Facebook at this time, and he was a world champion. I was like, hey, I want to come train with you. He's like, yeah, 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 come train with me. Next thing you know, I'm hopping on an airplane. I show up. I, I Facebook him. I'm like, hey, I'm here. He's like, what do you mean you're here? I was like, I'm at your gym. They say it's it's locked up. You're not here. And he's like, you're at my gym for real? I said, yeah. And then Andy came down. And I was like, you said on the, on the text, like, you're going to have a place for me to stay, this and that. And he's like, oh, I don't think he thought I was really going to come. And then there I was. And I Got to stay with Andy, live with Andy Sauer for two months. The world, it was great. You know, yeah. it, I just had experience. So, with, you know, I was, for some reason, I always meet everyone. I always, <laughs> yeah. whatever, I, whatever I put in my mind, it, it comes true. Sure, man. Yeah. And then, so then, you know, so from there, like, how do you end up becoming like a four time We Thai world champ? Like, I mean, just, just shit luck, I guess. Huh? <laughs> I, mean, I, I really, right place, right time, right, right techniques. So where, what are some of the other places? I know you, you trained in Thailand for a year. I lived in, Thai, I lived in Thailand. I lived in Holland. Those are those were long terms. They yeah. were like a year's, a year apiece in each of those. Things. I was in Italy. I was in England. I was in Japan. I was in Iceland. 
hold on, I, I haven't thought this stuff in years. Yeah, sure. I think that's about it. I think it was like six different places. Hold on, Japan. Yeah, I think that's about it. Yeah. I mean, I, where, where, you know, I went to Italy because Giorgio Prosian was a champion. I was like, I'm going to go train with Giorgio. So I, yeah. about my, I mean, I had good management, had connections. So I went out there. I so, the, so by then you weren't just Facebooking him saying, hey, no, I'm coming no, no, to your no. gym. I, 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 had a, I had a manager. I had a manager <laughs> at that point. And he'd be like, oh, this guy's coming, you know. That's, I, I mean, that's how I met Dwayne. I, I trained with Dwayne Ludwig, too, a, a really famous fighter, American fighter. Yeah. Fa- he had the fastest knockout in UFC history for a while. I don't know if he still does or not. I don't, I don't follow the sport no more. Once I retired, I kind of like moved on to other other things in life so yeah but so i know like you know obviously earlier when we were hanging out you would tell me some crazy stuff about like what was your favorite place well before we get into that but what was your kind of favorite where do you think you learned the most or what was the what was i think um or, or what were some of the more interesting places you 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 trained or what were some of the most important lessons you kind of got oh thailand was crazy thailand was a you know i was I was at a gym owned by a certain group of people, and you could just tell that, you know, those kids that were there not on their own will. It wasn't here where it's like, oh, I want to be the next skateboard star, and my, my mom's promoting me. It's just kind of like you're going to be a fighter. You, you, have, you have three things to do in Thailand if, if, if you're a, from a poor family. You could be a farmer, a fighter, or a lady boy. So you take your choice. So if you can't farm and, and if you can't fight, you're pretty much d- – literally dicked in a way that's horrible yeah Yeah. that's so crazy it's a different perspective than yeah like people get into here because it's like a a a sport or for the for for the sport of it out there it's like you were saying it's a a survival they they, they pimp their kids out they need them they need that money you know like basically like kids are like a dog you put the dog in the backyard and you watch them fight and then next thing you know they okay you have a next kid or kids no good and then he's going off to do something else yeah, I mean, literally, Coban said to me one time, he's like, "Americans will never understand Thai boxing," and I was like, "Oh,", oh. and I was looking at him all confused, and he's like, "When I was fighting, I was fighting for medicine for my sister to survive, to live. Yeah. I didn't win. I didn't get enough money to buy her medicine; she would die. You're fighting for a plastic trophy." And then it really hit home. I'm like, "Man, like, I'm never, no one here ever is going to ever get this." Yeah, you know. He's like, you, you fight with broken foot. You fight with, you, you don't, you don't go there and the guy's three pounds overweight and you decide not to fight. He's like, you fight because you're, you're fighting so people will live, man. You're fighting so your, your family's has food to eat. Literally for survival. Survival. Yeah. You're yeah. Not, yeah. So when, when you're doing that, it's a little bit different than fighting for a fancy tr- trophy or, or a title or a, something. A, uh, well, yeah. A t-shirt. So <laughs> a how ring, do you, a ring card girl. <laughs> so given that, you know, how did you, what, like, did that make you train extra hard? Because, like, because now you, you're understanding some of the mindset. Yeah, I mean, you train harder and stuff like that. And when you win things, like, you know, like when I met when I met him and the first time I went to his gyms, I was like, hey, where's all your world titles? And he's like, oh, you want to see my world titles? And I was like, yeah, yeah. He had all these like, great ones. You know, he was like an eight-time, nine-time world champion. So we go upstairs and do his room, and he opens up his underwear drawer, and he moves his underwear out of the way. He's like, here, here's my world titles. <laughs> and I was like, you keep them in your underwear drawer? He's like, yeah. He's like, in Thailand, everyone has a title. Like, what's it matter? Yeah, he's like I rather had the money. Yeah, I wanted the money. I didn't want. I don't know. I don't yeah. care about a paper belt, uh, a plastic belt. Yeah, yeah. And I just like now at home. At home, I keep all my belts in my underwear drawer. Just something yeah. in my mind. Yeah, like, sure. I, no, none of my, nothing was on my wall from my fight career at all. Yeah, that yeah. must have been a, a huge perspective changer for you. Yeah, it, it was. It, I mean, I, I went down the right road. You know, a lot of kids are, don't go down the right road. I mean, just by seeing the r- realness. Yeah. Intro. It's very interesting. Not looking. I never. I never sat back like we're doing right now and think about how many interesting situations I was in. Sure. Over, over the years. Yeah, man. Yeah. And no, no. And that's that's the thing. You know. Um. Uh, everyone's got to rev when they come by. We're, again, we're broadcasting. We're we're, we're broadcasting from the, uh, the the parts county here at Chop Ed. So everybody that drives by on a bike feels the need to throttle and rev up. I don't know if this came through came through on the mics or not, but um, but yeah, man. So. Like what else, man? What are some? What have been some of the other important lessons, or or situ, or cool, or like interesting situations, or things that you've learned along the way? Because, um, you know, these things are getting jujitsu and MMA and all that stuff. They're not going down in popularity. They're only getting more, more, more popular. Like what? Are, 
it's always interesting to me. Like there's people that get into it that are like kind of just doing it for like a hobby. There's, you know, there's people that are doing it for, for just uh, like a hobby or for, for physical activity or kind of just treading lightly in it. And then there's people like you that jumped full fucking force into it and, and, and kind of pushed your way through and, and, and made shit happen. Like, like, so like you said, you've, you've, you haven't thought about a lot of this stuff in a while, but what are some of the other kind of interesting things? Cause that's the beauty of a long form. No, like we don't have a list of questions here. Yeah. Like, you know, that's the beauty of a long form conversation with me and you were just shooting the shit, man. Like, I, I, I would have never said in a million years, this face would have took me all over the world. Everyone <laughs> wanted to punch me in it, but at least they <laughs> yeah. took me all over the f world. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I got to see numerous different countries, different cultures. I mean, it, it was great. That aspect of it, you know? Did any of the styles resonate more with you? Like, cause you oh, know, I, I love the Dutch style, the Dutch style I, later on in my career, it was, you know, and they had more money in the Dutch style and it was it fit my style more. It was more boxing with low kicks and you know, yeah. it just, I just like it better. Yeah. Thai style is very slow, you know, yeah. it, was, it was very slow style, you know, it's more of a beautiful style. Dutch style, you're, you're kind of more pushing your wheel on someone, I would say. Sure. Yeah. Everything's more powerful, and you can see it in the in the K ones and in the glories. Yeah, some of the like, it's show times, you know. So. And did you compete in glory and stuff? Or? Yeah, I have the, actually. I have the fastest knockout in glory history, seventeen seconds. Wow. Yeah. Nice. Is that the one with the with the with the with the combo you said the basic combo? Yeah, basic. It was a jab cross. I, I got ten ten thousand dollars in the fastest knockout. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and and I know for a while, like, I, how long have you been retired? Eight years now. Yeah. Yeah. And no, no, does you just kind of shut that I off? Mean, I, I did seminars and stuff, and then just, you know, if you're not in, in the light all the time, then you fade away, your, your name goes, and the next generation comes up, which is, you know, good. The, I, the natural progression yeah, of things. I, I had my time in, in the, the spotlight, and now it's time to sit back and I'll watch these young kids come up, and maybe someone will catch my eye, and I'll be like, oh, man, this is really good. I wish I would have fallen. Like, look at Mike Tyson. Was it 50, 52 years old and coming out of retirement, just to smash on some people? Yeah, and, yeah. And, Guess he's gonna be the oldest professional ever, to, uh, oldest boxer to ever come uh, and fight professional. I think it's insane because, like, you know, a year or two ago, you, he was like, "I'm not even gonna." He didn't even want to tr practice because he said it would bring out some shit in him that he didn't want to come back out. And now he's, now he's just like, he must have started, and then now he's jumping right back into the fucking fire, dude. So, sometimes they reach in your pocket and you only feel your leg, and you're like, <laughs> ah. I guess I better go back to my bicycle and <laughs> start riding again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, what's weirdest things taking you, man? I know, um, I know you you got out of fighting, um, and uh, you know for a while you were doing like seminars and I training. Did seminars, and, so. and I train at uh, Rat Pack in Palmerton, Pennsylvania. I still, I've been there for 10, 12 years, so I still keep my schedule there. But I'm not really looking at picking up any other spots. And um, I just recently got back from. I moved to West Hollywood. I wanted to live out my '80s fantasy. Yeah. And uh, and I'm just trying to do some some work with bands and and uh, female actresses and stuff. <laughs> you know, I, I've worked with Christina Rose in a couple of different bands. I worked for Vince Neil for a while doing personal security. Yeah, so it was all good. Well, Vince Neil just two or three days, not long. Sure, sure. Yeah. That's cool. But that must have been your uh, good. Oh, it's great. You did, know? did that burst a bubble on your '80s fantasy working for Vince Neil now? No, I mean, <laughs> I, mean I, I, I mean, that was back when I was still fighting when I worked for Vince. It was only, I was feeling, I, I thought I was doing security, but when I, when I look at it now from this aspect, I really wasn't. His manager was telling me, like, I was just a trained monkey. He's like, pick him up here, take him here, take him back. And then I had experience to, to do it all on my own. I had to write down my own schedule. It's way different when you're in charge. I mean, you know, from working with somebody at, at, a, at a garage and owning your own garage, it's, it's really different when you have to make up your own. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you have to make up your own routine. Sure. So, I'm going to be working on this for a while and hopefully have the same assess as I had and everything else I put my mind to in life. Sure. So it's a, one of the, so, uh, so that's kind of the next thing is just working in personal yeah. security. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I'm affiliated with a lot of musicians and stuff already. I, I, I do, I do merch and I'm a driver for old time casuals from Lars. who's also in Ranson. So yeah. I, I get to meet some different people and hear some great stories from Lars. He, he opened up his, his world yeah. to me. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Much respect to that guy. And, and oh, Dan. Yeah. Fuck yeah, man! What uh, what uh, I I know you're um, you 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 went to L.A., came back. Did you come back because of all this bullshit? That's yeah, going cr on? Corona, Corona, I, everything. The wheels started going. Like everything was going great. It was great. I was hanging out from dudes from 
uh, LA Guns and Faster Pussycat was at the Rainbow Room all the time. I have Ron Jeremy's personal phone number yeah, now. Yeah. You know, and I was like, oh, this is great. This is living my fantasy. And then and then Corona comes and just <laughs> and flushes everything. So, yeah. I, I mean, I'll go back again. Yeah, man. I was hoping I was hoping for uh, November, but now it doesn't seem like LA is opening up because of the Corona to to pie November. So I'm gonna wait sure it's up and running again before I go back. Yeah, it's it's gonna suck because you just started your your personal uh, security career and then the 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 rugs kind of pulled out from under you. There's there's no one's going anywhere or doing anything. There's, you know, I mean, unless you're guarding someone's house, there's really no. Yeah, no, I don't want to do that. I don't, no. I don't want to be up in the mix. Yeah, of course, man. Watching someone's dog. In the <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so for anyone listening, if you're in the need of uh, personal security, hey. you can you can reach out to uh, Eric and uh, what. Um, you know, so one of the other tie-ins, man, and then, you know, obviously a lot of the guys that come on this podcast, it's a lot of music and motorcycle stuff. Like, um, I know you used to run the Blood for Blood Skull on your uh, on your trunks when you were competing. Like, oh, yeah. So you you know you're coming from a hardcore and punk background. What 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 was that path like? Like you know, is, is what like what got you in? A, like, when did you start getting into like punk and hardcore? What led you into that stuff? And did that kind of? Do you feel like that kind of? How did that? jive with your career like in, in fighting you know i mean the blood for blood stuff the lyrics just you know it's just great lyrics and it was and at that time period you know that that was that was the band that was the angry band and I, if you watch my fighting on on youtube if you google my name like i i use a scarhead song as my thing you see the blood for blood trunks and you see my style it, it represents that error of music very well my style represents that error of music very well i believe yeah you know and then how how did I get into hardcore? I, mean, I got into hardcore as a uh, as a young as a young kid. You know, I remember I, I used to listen to a lot of Oi and stuff like that. And uh, one of my buddies w- uh, li- was living in my town. My my friend Mark. And, and when uh, I when I say Oi, like hardcore, like I mean any of it, like punk, yeah. hardcore, Oi. To me, there it's all the same yeah. same different different, different little jo- different genres or different, different genres things, of so of the same bigger many, picture. You know, so I was listening to a lot of a lot of Oi and stuff like that. And one of my buddies was like, "Hey, man, like." check out this stuff. And he, he gave me a, a scar, a scarred record. And I, I sat back and I was listening to it and I was like, man, I can relate so much with this stuff. Like, this is yeah. great. And how I, I, I want to live my future. I don't know if it was the best future of life, but I thought, <laughs> you know, like, like got the strip little did you know, uh, if you could look, look full forward in time, yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, I ended up meeting Danny Diablo actually at, at a gas station, like, man, maybe a year or two after I got that thing, it was great. And we clicked, you know, we clicked it off. He, he was playing with, um, Jamie Josta and, and uh, he opened up for Hate Breed at Crocodile Rock, which isn't even there no more. In uh, the band he had with Jamie, uh, what was, what was Ice it? Ice Pick. Ice Pick, yeah. Ice Pick opened up for Hate Breed at Crocodile Rock, and Isaac was trying to find Reading, Pennsylvania. He stopped at the gas station for directions, and I was just standing Stopping there. To be there. And he started talking to me. So, yeah. You know, hey. the history went from there, you know. Then it, it, it's funny because I gave him directions then, and I was fighting in Europe, and I got my ribs broke. And then I, I think it was like MySpace at the time, and I put on my, my MySpace like, got my ribs broke. It sucked like all, all like down and out. And then and Isaac was hit me up. He's like, "Where are you?" I was like, "I'm in Europe." <laughs> and he's like, "No, no, where are you?" Like, what else? What hotel? And he sent, sent some dudes over to chill with me. I was like, you know, so some guy reached out across the border and had some people come and show me around Holland. I was in living yeah. in uh, Holland then. It took me. I, I was there maybe a couple of weeks. Took me around, showed me the red light, showed me like, good food places to eat. Yeah, everything I want to do. The guy just really reached out. He was like. No man, kick ass guy to me. That's the that's what I find has been one of the coolest things through life um, with with like punk and hardcore and oi, you know, with with our music scenes or in even with motorcycling. Like, if you're somewhere and you're stuck or some shit's going on, there's there's like you you got some instant friends, like you know, and mm-hmm. and and there's always someone that knows somebody somewhere, and it's just like like you said, you just put that out, and then all of a sudden it was like, all right, where are you? Blah, blah, blah. And then like a day later that day or yeah, something like so, now so there's people taking you around and showing you around showing me, show me around europe yeah was, you know it's like you can pretty much go any place in the world and through punk hardcore motorcycles or fighting you yeah, probably know yeah. somebody or you can get to yeah. somebody somewhere yeah, 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 and and uh I, I forget who was it howard Starn that used to say i don't know if we can use people's names yeah, no, yeah it, right. every, everyone's everyone knows everybody through eight people it's like kevin bacon or something like, oh six degrees of separation yes uh, and but he calls it like the six degrees of kevin bacon how yeah. every, how everyone in hollywood's connected through kevin bacon it was funny yeah but it's, it's very true you know yeah. I, I met guns and roses my childhood dream band uh, through, through the music, through through people I knew in punk rock and hardcore, through through Paul Bearer yeah. and, and and different guys like that, I got to meet 
heroes and, and Tal at Crossroads, you know? Yeah. I got to meet my fucking... If those guys knew how many hours and hours I, I sat around listening to their music and how much hard times as a youth it got me through. Sure. Oh, man. Well, that's the beauty of music, man. That's what it. That's one of the things it does, man. Is, especially, I mean, it doesn't matter when in life, but it seems to resonate particularly more when, when you're a kid and you got more, probably when you got more time or something and less responsibility, but you go through hard times and, and music is a good fucking thing to bounce off of and, 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 and yeah. get you through shit, you know? Yeah. Um, fuck, dude. What... Uh, what um, where they know this? There's some else. You also have a very uh, strong interest in the Manson family. <laughs> I, 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 I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't say in the whole family. I just yeah. think Charlie got um a shitty end of the stick. You know, I but, think. But a, what got you interested in that whole thing in uh, general? Just, like, just like okay, here's a guy who wasn't at the murder scene. Neither nights. Yeah. Didn't didn't stab no one. Didn't whatever. And they're like, next thing they know, they they pull this jailhouse rat because he'd been in jail all his life up to this point. And they're like, oh, you're, you're trying to start this huge race war and what? And just throw it on this one little dude to cover up something big. Made something's always getting covered up. I feel. And I'm like, here's this guy who didn't kill nobody who probably did like 57 years in jail for a crime he didn't do. Yeah. And I'm not into I'm not into Dom or I'm not into any of these other people. I just feel he got the shitty end of the stick. Yeah. He, if I was anyone else, and it wasn't all over publicity. He would have got out, maybe doing 20, 20 years. Yeah. And this guy does his whole entire life because it was famous people. Yeah. I think there's more about it. I mean, you definitely need to look up Nicholas Shrek's book, um, The Manson Files. He knows a lot more about it than I do. And he, he gets all into it how it, was, how it was a drug deal that went bad, and all, all these people are connected in Hollywood. You know, it's like the John Holmes thing. The John Holmes thing was all a drug deal that went bad, and, and people got whacked. I think I think they call that that crime the four on the floor because mm. you know, the one survived. I think yeah. the Manson thing was very similar. You know, someone with higher powers, I don't want to say who or whatever, said, these people done me wrong. I'm famous or I got money. I can't put myself in a situation. I'm going to hire this this jailhouse dude to take his people to go handle my business. And it got blown out of the water. Mm. So that's my whole thing. Sure. You know, I, don't, I really don't believe the whole race war thing and whatever. They were a bunch of hippies. They're a bunch yeah. of hippies in California. Yeah. You know? And then the the, the, the swastika is head that everyone's gonna bring out. That was that was a sign like like a biker wearing it. You you, you see a Jewish shock bi- value. Yeah, shock you, you see a Jewish biker wearing a swastika patch. You know. Yeah, it was a yeah. shock value he, thing. He, he, he said he was xing himself off to the world, and that's the most famous x in the world. Mm. That's what he said. So know. you're looking at it as like like a a guy that was like a, not an underdog, but like a like a dude that was framed type of yeah, thing. Yeah, like, like like not not to get all political and stuff. Like look look how these cops treat minorities right now beating them and whatever that ain't not some white dude but they looked at charlie they're like we can throw this guy on the bus he has all this thing we can make we can we, we have time money and whatever why not throw him under the bus and then it, swipe it under and then the people who really did it can get away and still be whoever okay so yeah. f- for you like and, and me like i think he took the rap for somebody yeah you know okay I see. I didn't. I didn't read. I didn't read that book. I just, you know, just Manson just became an iconic subculture phenomenon, yeah. and you know, and it's yeah. just like a, a famous, you know, especially that that issue of a uh, Time Time magazine. Time magazine, yeah, like just a, yeah. or Life or whatever. It was, it was. Life. It was in Time too. There was, yeah. was all of them. Magazine. That cover though, that famous shot, like yeah. became such a like a came, iconic. Came with a good T-shirt. Sold probably millions of T-shirts. Yeah, I know. Ax- Axel Rose wore that stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but actually, before like w- as a dude from uh, from humble beginnings in Pennsylvania, what what is your you have such an attraction to eighties Los Angeles, <laughs> <laughs> so much so that in two thousand twenty you 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 moved to Los or two thousand nineteen or whatever you moved to Los Angeles to live out your eighties Los Angeles farm. Did you did you find what you were looking for out there, or, uh, were, or was, were you disappointed? It, it, it was great. It looks great. <laughs> shout out to everyone at the Rainbow. Shout out to everyone at the Seventh Vale. Yeah, I mean. Well, the rainbow, like you were saying earlier, is, is a weird place because there's like the seedy element, the the tourist element, and then just like the regular, regular the regular yeah. uh, element you to it. You can bump into everyone in one little area. Yeah, yeah. And have some great food and soup. Just depends what room you're in, it right? Just depends what room you're in, what you, <laughs> what you see, what you can get your hands on. Yeah, because you just said like, just like life, you yeah you can you can go in there and see anyone from Ozzy and Lemmy back in the day to to you know Joe Blow who just came in to look at pictures on the wall and have some pizza. Yeah. Or, the, or someone that just lives down the street that yeah. came in for a beer uh, and, a, and, a, oh, yeah. and a, some fries or yeah, something. Yeah. Because it's like Frankie hangs out there all the yeah, time because saying. he lives right. That's like his neighborhood. Yeah, I, 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 I live right by there. That's why I was going every day. I was really close and it was good food. And eventually you, it's your local bar, you know, no, no, 
No different than Applebee's in my own town. <laughs> Shout out to Applebee's too. Uh, Rainbow's a little different than Applebee's, I think. And I don't think we got to give Applebee's a shout out, dude. <laughs> that place sucks. <laughs> I like. It. Do you? I'm from Alton, Pennsylvania. It's like a, a eating eating fine dining, fine dining. You know, you know. Uh, I don't think it was Allentown. Somewhere in Pennsylvania, there was this place called Quaker Shake and Lube. You ever gone that? No. No, it's like a little chain, but they have like when you go inside, there's like. It's um, it's like a, a a small chain. I think it's Pennsylvania. It might I may be wrong. I, this is like road stories from like yeah. you know you know yeah. guys. We travel a lot, and it was um, it was this place. Yeah, it definitely was in Pennsylvania. Qu- Quaker Steak and Lube. I, I'm not trying to give them a shot. I don't. I'm not connected. <laughs> I haven't even been to one in fucking ten years. Might not but, be there no more. Yeah, probably not. Yeah. But no, no, because I've traveled recently and I've seen them off the side of the highway. But when you go in there, it's all old cars and old motorcycles. Oh, that's like cool. literally. I remember we sat at a table and we were under an old car. They had an old car under a lift, and we were like sitting under a car. Like you look up and you see the exhaust oh. in the bottom. You know, the, the 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 floor of the car and everything, yeah. and um. And all I remember was like that's where they had these things, uh, these wings that atomic uh, fire wings, where you had to sign a waiver because they were so fucking hot. Like you, ah. you, you didn't want to die. Uh, uh, some of our friends are showing up here in the background, um, but uh, but I, I I don't even I I, don't, I have no place to go with that other than yeah. that's a Pennsylvania I mean, place. Pen- other than Applebee's, pen- a, pen- a good pen- alternative. Pen- <laughs> Pennsylvania is known for old cars and old bikes and stuff. In, in Dutch, know, in the Dutch, Pennsylvania Dutch are up there. Yeah. And Eric Uch. Eric Uch. Yeah, man. For now. And uh, and Wisdom in Chains. And uh, uh, who else is from Pennsylvania? Um, I don't know. I don't know. No, no, I'm uh, sure there's plenty. Yeah. <laughs> Strength for the Reasons from Pennsylvania. Strength for Re- Carl and them are all nice dudes. Fuck yeah, yeah, man. What else? What else, man? Anything? I know. It's just so everyone knows, Eric came into town to get lasered. We're doing this quick podcast, and we got a bunch of friends coming to to kind of see him off. So we, we're seeing in the background friends start to circulate around. But um, uh, you know, usually these go a little bit longer. But is it? I know we're gonna have to cut off soon before more more start showing up and breaking in. We, we've kind of <laughs> isolated ourselves in the front room, and and uh, I know there's gonna be a jailbreak any second. But anything important that we haven't hit or touched on that that uh. Things important. Or any other fight experiences? Like, what was it like to win your first We Tie World Champion, and where was it? The the first title was at the Hollywood Park Casino. Actually, I I, I fought the Hollywood Park. No, it wasn't Hollywood Park. I'm sorry. I fought in San Diego. The first uh first title it was in San Diego at some um air air, air oh, where they where they park airplanes. They clean all the airplanes out. Ha- hangar. Hangar. Yeah, some air hangar, and then you know. All, all the all those ones were, were all California based. <laughs> I, I fought I won in one in New York uh, for Church uh, Church Street. Um, what was it? Friday Night Fights NYC. I used to fight for them a lot. Justin Blair and and Jason Stroud and all of them always took care of me. I was always a a, a favorite and a, a main eventer for for Friday Night Fights. That's and cool. it's still going on. It's a very very good show. Sure. Now now that they have a, a, a firm, former fighters are actually helping Justin out. Uh, Ed, Eddie and all these guys are are coming up and you know. That's their part of retirement. They stayed in the sport. Now they want to promote it and make it bigger. Sure, so that's also really good. What? What? How? When? When was your first title? And uh, how old were you? And how long have you been fighting at that point? Uh, my first title was early on. I, I was really lucky because the people I knew, I you know, you know how it is. You can get you can jump line if you know people. Yeah. So I think the the first first title was the first year of Thai boxing. So I was I was probably. In, in my twenty, like in my twenties, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know the date off. The top sure, of my sure, head. no, no, but just roughly, yeah. 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 So it wasn't too well, long into well, it. Had to be, had to be oh oh three, had to be oh three. It was before I was with Fairtex. It was oh oh three because I was already had one. I had one world title before I was with Fairtex, and I got three with Fairtex, and then from there I went to Dutch style, and I, I didn't have no win, no world titles after that. Okay. What what um what kept you going? So like you win a world title, so you must be feeling good, and then you go to Fairtex and you you yeah, get you kind feel, of you get your ass handed to you yeah, twice, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then like what kept you going through all that? Just that I I love putting myself at the bottom of the pile. Everyone always wants to be the top and be with the easy people and whatever. It's like it's not fun for me. It's yeah. like you have to have gain. I'm always have to like what's next? What's next? What's next? So you know you, you know, like you like to to pull yourself up yeah it's like i have this title now what title is better than this title oh this company over here is better let's go to this company and win that title and that's a, until, yeah. until you you know melcher told me in the beginning of the uh, of my career he's like anyone could be the tough guy and they're three blocks radius he's like you want to be the tough guy 
in America. And once you uh, conquer America, then you want to conquer the world. You yeah. know, like what, what, what's what's that uh, Scarface uh, slogan? Like, isn't tomorrow's the world or something? Like, the world is yours. Or yeah, the, the world is yours. Yeah, you know, like who, anyone can sit in your own little area and, and be known for whatever. You know, t- twenty people, thirty people know you, but then we get make the area bigger and bigger and bigger and just take it over. Yeah, you know. Look at all, like almost all the bands that we know. They start off in a small scene and they grow bigger than stadiums and whatever. And then they're doing three day festivals. Like you, yeah. you know, just want to be the guy in the bottom all the time. I sure, mean, I'm sure some people enjoy it, but then they don't have the right outlook in life. Yeah. So it seemed like you like you like humbling yourself and then pulling yourself, working exactly. yourself up. Yeah. You know, start in the bottom and at the top. Yeah. I think it's a rap song. And then then you get to the next thing and then you yeah, start at the, the bottom, bottom of that and, and you get to the top side. of that top of that tier and then that so once on. You conquer so. all that, you look over there and you're like, oh, I want to jump over this pond and, and go over there and whoop all these yeah. euros up and, and do whatever you got to do. Now, w- competing in Thailand, um, like, did, did you have a lot of uh, like victories there? And what did, no. what? I, I, I had a, a knockout and then I had a, a couple losses. It, yeah. it, it, you know, it, was, it didn't fit my style. Oh, yeah, you say it, yeah. it wasn't style, like, wasn't losses. Like, I got knocked out or whatever. So I lost some points. Technical, I, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I lost some points because I, I wasn't really a kicker and they like, yeah. like kickers. There was, yeah, and that's that's why uh, going over to, to uh, Europe, the Dutch better. style yeah, was, was more, better, was better more for, suited yeah. for you. If, you. if you watch my highlight videos, it's mainly all boxing with a low kick. Yeah, very, very simple style, but effective for me. But but that could that's been gaining some popularity yeah, as well. Yeah, it's like, great. It's, it's coming up like the UFC. Like it's weird when I start when I started with MMA, kickboxing was way bigger and there was more money. Then I switched over to kickboxing and then MMA blew up. So yeah. we're at, one thing I learned in life is wherever I am, the money will not be. <laughs> <laughs> you sh- you showed up a day late. <laughs> yeah, that, that day, day late, three dollars short. Yeah. Well, yeah. oh, fuck yeah, man. So, dude, I think we had a. Uh, I, I, that's a very fucking. I, I'm sure a lot of people find that very interesting because because okay. these things are very you know popular now. But yeah. like you know to hear about it from the grassroots perspective and and you know what goes into it. And I'm sure we didn't even scratch the surface of really the dues that you paid. You know what I mean? And, that's and like people have to sign up and log on. To, you know to bring me back. Yeah, fuck mm-hmm. yeah, man. So get those followers. Yeah. Well, so how can uh, how can someone find you? Uh, Facebook, Facebook, in, uh, Instagram. Uh, my Facebook's my name, Eric Glitch. I actually there's multiple ones, but um, you'll see what's the one. what's the real one? Yeah, it's Eric Glitch, but there's there's like three or four Eric Glitches on there. Okay, so you have to look. I don't even know what my my phone's turned off right at the moment. I don't even know what my logo, uh, what my picture is at at this time. But what about what's your Instagram? I know uh, it's my, not Eric Glitch. My Instagram is uh, hooligan fifty one fifty. Okay. Yeah. All right, man. Well, fuck yeah, dude. I want to thank you for for, thank you for, for taking the time to come out and fucking. It's good to do a face to face one when we're in the middle of this crisis. I've been doing a lot of phone ones lately, and hopefully this shit wraps up soon, and and uh, and uh, you know we can get back to normal life or as as close to a normal life as we can, so we can travel and see each other again. Yeah. This weekend we're supposed to be in New York City, fucking all hanging out oh, with, yeah, the, with, with bowl, yeah. the Black and Blue Bowl, Bowl which is uh, postponed to September. Um, My birthday weekend now in September sixth, uh, seventh, and eighth. Yeah, so if you if, if you look for some information on that, you can uh, follow at B and B Productions on uh, online uh, on Instagram. But I just got to do a couple of commercials. Just sit with me because you know oh. some of these guys. Um, first off, I just got to thank Chop Cult for sponsoring the show. Uh, Chop Cult is the uh, the world's kind of biggest uh, online forum for motorcycle and chopper related stuff um, and they have a bunch of shit going on man like you know they have a uh, they have a um, uh, a social <laughs> sorry man I'm pulling something up as we talk so they uh, they have a, 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 a an online blog a uh, online message board um, and, uh, you know, I've, I forget what the other word for, for message board is, but whatever, you know what a message board is and it's broken up by section. So you can look at, if you want to find information or tech advice about old Harleys or old triumphs or Japanese bikes or new Harleys or this and that, there's, there's, there's different, uh, tech information. Uh, there's just areas to talk shit. There's areas about, uh, upcoming events. There's all kinds of stuff going. It's a forum. Forum oh, is the form. other word I was nice. looking for besides message board. But they also have like a weekly um, uh, email list where they blast out news related to the motorcycle world. Um, and uh, they have uh, classifieds, which is a really important thing, especially if you're in the old weird chopper stuff and you want to find some rare parts or whatever, or just rare parts for your old bike or new bike, whatever. But uh, check them out. It's at chopcult.com. And then 
uh, online at, at all, all the social medias is just at Chop Cult, whether that's Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, or Pinterest. Pinterest. Um, and as always, membership is free. So if you go to chopcult.com, you can get into the fray for absolutely nothing. And you don't got to put a credit card or nothing sketchy in. Now, outside of that, me and Eric have some friends that own a clothing company called Amerta. Oh, nice guys. Great nice guys. guys, yeah. And um, if you haven't heard about them, they're a streetwear brand. And um, a lot of their clothing is on American-made apparel, and they screen stuff in-house. I know Dirty Mix in there fucking screening his hands to the fucking bone and, and uh, uh, making T-shirts for you. And uh, they do T-shirts. They got socks. They got pomade. They got... Uh, outerwear hoodies jackets all kinds of shit so check them out it's uh and 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 these dudes are real deal dudes it's not just like a fly-by-night streetwear brand some dudes came on something and thought it was cool and jumped into a scene and starts making money off it no these dudes have been around for a long time and paid a lot of dues in a lot of different ways so uh check them out amertamia.com o-m-e-r-t-a-m-i-a uh or on instagram at amertamia and facebook at amertamia um, they, they even have a fucking app you can download. Did you download the app yet? Ed? Yeah, I got it. I got it too. And, uh, I ordered some shirts off it. Um, now the other thing is, um, these guys have also extended this courtesy to you. If when you're checking out, use the promo code big truth and you get 20% off your order. So if you order a thousand dollars worth of things, you only pay $800 and you got $200 to do other shit. You can go to Applebee's with Eric, <laughs> take Eric, Eric to Applebee's. Um, or, uh, you know, if you buy a hundred dollars worth of stuff, it's only 80 bucks. So, you know what I mean? In this time when, uh, when, uh, you know, funds might be low because you're, uh, not working. Um, and you're not one of the lucky ones that are getting that extra $600 a week from the government on top of, of uh, other unemployment, um, you know, t you, you still need some new work. You need, you still need some new wares when you go out, when the world opens up. So uh, uh, use that promo code and save yourself some money. And also we want to thank Pitchfork for sponsoring us. And Pitchfork oh, yeah. is a, is a uh, Pitchfork New York. Um, well, PitchforkNY.com or, or on Instagram at PitchforkNY. Uh, uh, our friend Warren, he has a, a clothing company. He puts out some really fucking cool designs. He also puts out a seven inch collection. Um, he's got a series of split seven inches that come out and they, they'll have different limited edition color vinyls. And it's always a band from the East coast and a band from the West coast. Yeah. Um, you know, for, for example, there was one that was like Murphy's law and rancid Murphy's, Murphy's law on one side, yeah. rancid on the other. There's been a ton of them. I'm sick of it all. One, uh, the newest one is, uh, no redeeming, uh, no redeeming social value on one side. And then our brothers from Arizona, uh, thug riot on the other. So make sure you, uh, go to pitchforkny.com and pick that up. Um, I think you can also get pitchfork stuff on all in So, so check, check both of those sites out and, uh, get up in there. And also, if you're uh, looking around, go to chopahead.com. Chopahead's my uh, motorcycle shop. And also, we have an online store. Um, and we have a, a, it's a, it's a one stop shopper. You come in here, we got a parts counter, we got a, a showroom, we got a, a, a full service shop in the back. Uh, we do fabrication work, we do um, uh, service and repair work on new and old. Uh, Harley's primarily, um, and also the occasional uh, new Triumph, and and uh, my old partner and good friend Jay is handling a lot of the uh, primarily handling the uh, vintage Triumph stuff now. Um, but you know, come in, uh, we will hook you up. You need a helmet, you want a oil change, you want us to build you a chopper, you need a T-shirt, anything in between, any part you want. Pretty much, I can get. If I don't have it, if I don't have it listed online, just give us a call or shoot us an email and I can get it to you. I'm set up with pretty much everyone. Or we can make it. So www.chopahead.com or on Instagram at chopahead and on Facebook, it's chopahead customs, customs with a K. And also full speed ahead show, uh, me and my buddy Packers, uh, um, hot rod and chopper and motorcycle and vintage motorcycle show. Um, that is going to be August 21st, uh, 20th and 21st or 21st and 22nd. I, I'm shitty with the dates. 21st is for sure. Whatever weekend that is, it's Friday and Saturday night. We've got a pre-party Friday night. The main show Saturday. Uh, we are operating as if it's going to happen. But again, this is uh, barring any uh, further COVID uh, closures and uh, restrictions for our large assemblies. But uh, check us out at fullspeedaheadshow.com or uh, online at fullspeedaheadshow on Instagram. Um, 
Yeah, man, that's about it. And then, you know, if you're really fucking bored, go to bigtruthpodcast.com and, uh, you know, listen to some other episodes, man. Eric, fucking awesome to see you. I'm glad you came out today. And, Thank you uh, for having me. Yeah, fuck yeah, dude. We will uh, we will do another one soon. And uh, I just know we got a bunch of people yeah, shocking yeah. around out yeah. there. I keep looking out and I see different faces. So we'll uh, uh, go entertain our friends. Nice. All right, nice. man. Thank see you. See you guys later.